Hi. Yeah, you all wave in silence. It's really weird, but I'll get used to it at some point. Um, okay. So, uh, so to get started today, um, first of all, we're going to do QCD today, which hopefully um, you realize is going to be harder than QED. And we're going to do the weak interactions last because, believe it or not, they're harder than QCD. Okay? But um, it's not going to happen today. It will happen next Tuesday. But um, I don't want you to think that what I'm, all I'm going to show you is how to do calculations and then that's it. Like you've learned this skill. If these two particles are coming in and these two particles are coming out, I can calculate the scattering amplitude or the differential cross-section, or if I got one particle and it decays, I can calculate the decay rate. That, I'm not interested in that at all. I mean, those are, these are essential calculational skills using the Feynman calculus, but um, what we want to do... Daniel? Are you on the phone? <laughs> what, what is that? got his phone like right up okay fine fine yeah okay thank you thank you he's playing animal crossing no i'm texting you nico oh sorry okay okay no 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 okay so with the qcd material um, next time we get together, we're going to look at some calculations, and they're not going to be quite like the calculations that we were doing. We're just going to focus on aspects of the calculations which are important. But we're going to reach two really, really interesting conclusions about the strong interactions, okay, which are not obvious at all from the start. But I'm going to be able to show you how those results emerge from the Feynman diagram calculations, okay? So I just, we're going to build up with some technical developments today, but on Tuesday of next week, we're going to take it to a really interesting conclusion as a result of calculations, okay? So I just don't want you to get too bored, especially as the class just gets more and more and more technical. All right, so moving right along, um, I'm going to start, hold on, get the lid off this. So I'm going to start with a hierarchy of interactions, okay? And this is kind of an overview of all of the interactions, and then we're going to spend our time focused ma mainly on the QCD interactions today. Um, but uh, in terms of hierarchy, there's different ways of talking about hierarchy. You can talk about the strength of the interactions or whatever. But I'm actually talking about the applicability of the interactions across the spectrum of particles. And it turns out that um, if we just look at, for example, start out with neutrinos, it turns out that neutrinos can only directly act directly interact via one of the standard model forces. And, oh, Gabriel, you want to let me know which force neutrinos can interact via? Well, assuming they're left-handed, they can be interacted with by weak bosons. So, yeah, so the neutrinos enjoy the weak interaction, all right? They do not experience directly the electromagnetic or the strong interaction, okay? What about charged leptons? Now remember, the leptons are those, those doublets of an electron, an electron neutrino, a muon, a muon neutrino, and a tauon, and a tauon neutrino. So I'm just talking about the electron, the muon, and the tauon. Sarah, are you volunteering an answer? Suggested it's because we have our videos on, so I might turn mine off. But um, like, you're super glitchy for me, so I can't really. 
understand sometimes. Mm. I'll turn my video I don't know if other people are experiencing that, but yeah. I, just, I can't. I can't read anything on the board right now. You can't read anything on the board? No. It's very pixelated. Uh, uh, yeah, I can see an H at the beginning, <laughs> maybe. Is this helping out? Like tall letter in the middle. But it's, it's worse than it normally is. Everyone huh. Bring it up. So everyone's on video, but I don't see much of an improvement. I mean, it's, it's a little bit improved. Oh, wait, now you moved. No, I'm in front of it. Is that any better? I oh. think it's an internet issue. Yeah, when you don't move, we can see it sometimes. But if I'm moving, you can't see it? Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. right without moving. <laughs> like, um. your mind. Yeah, my my internet it, it should be good. Yeah. Alex, you take your regular notes in OneNote, right? Um. Yeah, on a different computer. I guess, like, is there a way you could do it on OneNote and screen share? Because, like, the way Lust does it, he has like a tablet or something that he writes on and a camera that he's visible on. So, yeah. like, the screen sharing is just a lot clearer. Um, yeah, hmm. It's all right. We, I mean, like, you, of course, can't change it today. I was just wondering, since it's a little worse than normal. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's worse than normal. That seems a bit odd. Um, yeah. Am I, I wonder if I'm not doing something that I normally do. Um, it might just be Zoom. Like, it just gets overloaded sometimes. Yeah. It just, happens. And I think since everyone turned their videos off, it actually looks a little better for me. Uh, you can always try restarting the meeting and see if that fixes it. Yeah, let's do that. Let's restart the meeting. All right, we're going to end it and start it over again. Bye-bye. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah, I don't, is it still shaky? It's a little better. Can you read what's on the board? Yeah, kind of. Oh boy. You can extrapolate from what you say. Yeah. Okay, I'll try and write bigger. That might help. I thank you for my sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> this might just incur a lot more erasing. Okay. So um, let me draw a card. Oh, uh, Gabriel. Um, what forces are charged leptons directly interacting with? Weak and electromagnetic. Yes. Okay. Well, now let's go to the top of the food chain and let's ask about quarks. Let me draw a card. Oh, yeah, uh, Gabriel. What a surprise. Gabriel, what uh, forces do quarks directly interact with? Every single one. Yes, exactly. They interact directly via the weak interaction, the electromagnetic interaction. And I'll finish in just a second. And QCD. Now, this is just sort of a list of, you know, these particles interact via the least forces. This is the next, and this is the next. But what force is the get around force? What, for, what force gets everything? 
gravity <laughs> of the standard model forces. The weak, weak. Yeah. the weak interaction, yeah. So the weak interaction is actually the most pervasive of all of the forces. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of carries the weakest uh, impact, but we'll talk about that next week. Um, but, you know, this makes the quarks obviously the most interesting because they directly interact by the weak electromagnetic and QCD. And maybe the neutrino is the, most, the least interesting. But this is actually not the entire story. Because, for example, let me consider a process where I have an electron neutrino come in, an electron neutrino come out. And this is just mildly interacting with electron neutrino, okay? So it turns out that since these interact via weak interactions, and we'll learn more about this when we study the weak interactions, but the most basic diagram you can draw is a diagram like this. where the two electron neutrinos exchange what's called a Z naught, the weak neutral boson. Okay, that's, it, it, it's much like evaluating a diagram with, a, with a, a photon being exchanged. The difference is that Z naught has a mass. And again, this is something we're gonna work with later on when we actually deal with the weak interactions. But there you go. This is a reflection of this statement that neutrinos interact directly by the weak interactions, all right? But this isn't the only diagram that you can draw. You can draw this diagram. Notice it's still an electron neutrino and an electron neutrino interacting with each other. But that Z0 boson in its virtual prowess could happily split up into a quark anti-quark pair. Okay. And that quark anti-quark pair could interact with itself via the exchange of gluons, because they're quarks or through the exchange of photons because they're charged. So it turns out that when you consider higher order diagrams, even though the weak interactions only directly interact by, a, or sorry, because neutrinos only interact directly by the weak interactions does not mean that the electromagnetic and the strong interactions don't eventually play a role in their virtual states, okay? Does this make sense? So really and truthfully, if you consider all the virtual parts of the story, then really all the interactions are in bed with all the particles. And that's kind of democratic and good. Why would it try to do that instead of just, just using a gluon? You mean the Z-naught boson? Uh, yeah. Well, no, 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 so, um, you have to remember, when you calculate the amplitude for this process, this is the number that you put into Fermi's golden rule, okay? To calculate this, you have to calculate this, and you have to calculate this, and you have to add them together. Every single diagram contributes to M. It's not that you say, Oh, this happened, not this. Or this happened and not this. All of these things contribute to the amplitude. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. All right. I mean, this is the, this is the backbone of the path integral formalism, right? Which is one of the ways of formulating quantum theories, which is if you want to talk about a particle moving from here to here, there's the classical path that is the answer if you want to know what is the path that it, uh, associate, is associated with extremizing the Lagrangian. But if you want to do quantum, what you do is you take all the paths that connect those two points and you sum over all of them.
okay? Well, this picture of a sum over paths is this picture as a sum over paths, okay? So we're, what we're really doing is a symbolic manipulation of a path integral formula. Okay, so we're gonna turn to um, QED today. And I did say QED because I have to tell you how QED works with quarks before I tell you how QCD works with quarks. But the good news is, is that it's pretty simple. If I want to use quantum electrodynamics for quarks, hopefully that's big enough for you to see. Um, Uh, you can replace any electrons or anti-electrons, muons or anti-muons, or tauons with quarks. Okay, so literally when you're drawing a diagram with two positively charged, like a positively uh, a positively charged anti-electron and a positively charged anti-muon, you could replace that with a positively charged quark and a different positively charged quark, and calculating the QED amplitude for that is pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is that the coupling that you write down at each vertex, which is given by E times the square root of 4 pi over C, the E factor that goes in here is actually the electric charge of the particle that you're working with, and it turns out that the quarks don't have integer electric charges. They have fractional electric charges, and their fractional electric charges are as follows. Q is minus one-third, and maybe I can write prime there. So E is the fundamental electron charge unit. So it's the, it's the charge of the electron. So we can do everything proportional to E. So this is an E prime. But it turns out that Q is minus one third uh, E if you're dealing with an up, a, <laughs> an up a charm or a top quark. And Q is equal to two-thirds E if you're dealing with a down, a strange, or bottom quark. Okay? And we're not going to do a lot with this, but, you know, just, just scribble that down. Um, if you're dealing with an anti-up quark, what do you think the electric charge is? Let me grab a card. Oh, yeah. Gabriel. Gabriel? Yes. What do you think the charge of an anti-up quark is? Positive one-third? Yeah. The charges of antiparticles are always opposite the charges of the corresponding particle. So I'm not going to write down the charges of the antiparticles. You just reverse the sign. Okay? But that's interesting because that means of quarks with QED... We've got a spectrum of charges. We've got plus one-third, minus one-third, plus two-thirds, and minus two-thirds, which is way more interesting than QED for leptons, where everything is either plus or minus E. Okay? All right. Otherwise, doing everything with, um, with quarks and QED is the interaction. The, the rules go the same. You have to put in the same U and V factors, depending on whether you're dealing with quarks or anti-quarks. Um, and all the Feynman rules go the same, okay? So now we're going to turn to quarks and Q. CD. And this is where it's going to get ugly. Okay, so let me remind you of the governing Lagrangian for this theory. So first of all, we have a Dirac term, and we're
and we're summing over i equals 1 to 6, and if you really want to make this specific, you could sum over i equals up to bottom. But this is just giving each type of quark its own kinetic term, because the Lagrangian for all of QCD should include all the quarks at once. So this sum, don't really worry about it, it's just saying we're dealing with up quarks, we're dealing with down quarks, we're dealing with trom quarks, or whatever. It's really not that important. Um, and then we have the mass terms for each of them. Okay. And then you know that you have a gauge theory, which is indicated by this covariant derivative here, which I'll write down uh, in a, well, I'll go ahead and write it down. So the covariant derivative here is actually given by the partial mu on psi i plus i g lambda dot a, and we could call this g prime. No, actually, no, we don't call it g prime. Um, lambda dot a mu psi i. Okay, where well, remember these are the gauge fields each of which, there are eight of them, each of which corresponds to a gluon, and these are the generators. Of SU3. Okay. So we have the, the modified covariant derivative and the kinetic term for the quarks. We have the mass term for the quarks. And then, of course, we want to give this gauge field a kinetic term so that it can propagate. And the gauge field for the kinetic term looks a lot at first like the kinetic term for QED. Okay, where there are uh, some indices that are hidden here, which come out when we're writing uh, expressions like this. Um, but there are a few more terms. So we have g over 16 pi, f, a, d, e, a, d, mu, a, e, nu times d mu a nu a minus d nu a mu a minus something similar plus a term which looks very different. Okay. So these are all of our essential ingredients which sort of start out our QCD theory. And of course, what we want to do is extract fine minerals from this. Okay. Um, can anybody remember what these interactions are going to describe for us? Let me draw a card real quick. Oh, uh, Gabriel. You're talking about the, the end interaction terms? Yeah, these, these terms here. Yeah, they're going to describe self-interaction to the gauge fields. Yeah, they're going, to, they're going to express the interactions of gluons directly with other gluons. Notice in QED, we stopped with this term. Okay? But these interaction terms are representing interactions uh, for gluons interacting with other gluons. Okay, um, dup, dup, do, 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 do. let's see. Um, okay, so remember uh, for QCD, a psi field I 
has both red, blue, and green components. And I'm just, I'm just writing this and I'm, I'm, I'm just want to point out, like, I is indexing which quark we're dealing with. Is it an up quark, a down quark, a top quark, a bottom quark, strange quark, a charm quark? Okay? However, each quark gets this freedom in having red charge, blue charge, green charge, or a linear combination of them. Okay? So each quark field has three components in color space. And then there are six quark fields. Okay? What about antiquarks? Should I not include antiquark fields? Let me ask a question. Uh, Gabriel. Um, Gabriel, should I not have a term for antiquark fields? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, antiquarks are a part of the story. And this is just a Lagrangian for quarks, right? Yeah. No. No. Well, yeah. I mean, if you... Oh, I can't annotate shit. Um, it's okay. If you look at the Lagrangian, there's there's an anti-quark term in there. There's the uh, sidebar. I don't necessarily think that we can associate that with an anti-quark. I mean, bar is a symbol that we sometimes use for anti, but it's not, this bar is just indicating the adjoint. It's not necessarily indicating an anti-quark. But the truth is, is that when you solve for the size that satisfy the Dirac equation, you get both quark and, or you get particle and antiparticle solutions. So this, it's not that these are particles and these are antiparticles. But the equation of motion that comes from this bears a set of solutions which are clearly including particle and antiparticle because of the change in sign in the exponent. Okay, so the, the answer is you don't have to add a set of terms for antiparticles. They are part of this description. Okay, but don't associate them with the barred part. I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you had a, if you had a cork around and no antiquark, how would this term describe its mass if this was a quark in an antiquark description? That, that doesn't really make sense. So if you have a fluctuation that produces an up quark, this has somehow got to describe its mass or its contribution to the energy based on its mass. So both of these terms have to contribute to a particle excitation or an antiparticle excitation. Okay, um, yeah, so, uh, in comparison to QED, remember in QED there is one charge and one photon. Okay? In QCD there are three charges and eight gluons. So just like when I bitch and moan about four dimensions being highly degenerate because space-time vectors have four components and spinners have four components and oh my god, everything's four, 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 and blah, 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 blah. Similarly, if you have an abelian gauge group, U1, everything's degenerate. You got one charge, you got one gauge field. You might as well think that those two numbers always have to be the same. Well, here's an example of when they're not the same. In SU3, you get a three-component fundamental representation, which is just the little colors, but you get eight gauge fields, okay? So there's, a, there's no reason why these numbers have to be the same. All right, um, let's see what I can do. Okay, so there is... Um, So I have, I have a statement in here that I was going to make, but I'm not going to make it because it's actually one of the statements that we're going to prove next time. Um, so let me, let me, do, 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 do. yeah, let me say this. Um, let me erase a bit of this, give myself some room. Okay, so there is a, a, a method in labeling diagrams which 
we're kind of going to use, kind of not going to use, but bear with me. So let's suppose we have a cork come in and a cork go out, and the cork is going to interact with something else on the bottom that I'm not going to draw through the emission of a gluon. Okay, and if you haven't figured it out, the wavy line is a photon, the jagged line is either a Z naught or a W plus minus from the weak interactions, and then the curly lines are gluon lines. Okay, so when we're drawing diagrams, which boson we're using to mediate the interaction gets its own shape, okay? So we're gonna have a gluon which is emitted And there's this interesting thing that we automatically took care of in QED without even thinking about it, and that's the following. We said that if an electron comes in and it emits a photon, or it absorbs a photon, it doesn't matter, then there's two things that you can say about this. One is that the particle type doesn't change. If it's an electron emitting or absorbing a photon, then this line has got to be an electron. But moreover, it can't become an anti-electron. Why could, give me one reason why it doesn't make sense that an electron emits a photon and out comes an anti-electron. Let me draw a card. Oh yeah, uh, Gabriel. Conservation. Yes, exactly. This would violate charge conservation because you'd have a plus one or you'd have a minus one charge coming in and a plus one charge going out, but the photon doesn't carry any charge. Okay? Well, we might wonder how that story plays out in QCD, quantum chromodynamics, where the charges are encoded not by numbers but by colors. And it turns out, if we have a cork coming in, then that cork might be in an eigenstate of red, blue, or green. Or it could be in a linear combination, but let's just pick an eigenstate. So maybe this cork coming in is in a red eigenstate. What does this tell you about the outgoing cork? Uh, well, I'm assuming my card is on top for some bizarre reason. Well, no, I was going to let anybody answer that. But since you're on... <laughs> well, uh, it depends on which glue on. Whoa. Somebody else tapped in. I couldn't understand. Yeah, should I, should I chime in or should I not? Oh. Oh, Ross. <laughs> yes, you can tap in this one time, Ross. But otherwise, it's all Gabriel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... So essentially, the gluon can uh, the gluon usually will carry like a linear combination of color charges, and so a red cork coming in could be either a green cork or a blue cork coming out, or I guess it could be some linear combination if you emit like a lambda a gluon. But... Okay, all right. So I'm gonna say this is a blue. Okay. We're just gonna say that something interesting happens. The red cork turns into a blue cork. Okay? What colors does the gluon carry? If the gluon is going down. Gabriel. Uh, red and anti-blue? Yes, exactly. What if instead the gluon is going up? Anti-red and blue. Exactly. Okay? So you might notice, first of all, that you have to tell me what direction the gluon is going. And I don't, I don't really mean by its momentum. I really am kind of implying a line on the thing, okay? Because if you think about it, this gluon is the anti-gluon of this gluon, right? So you really should be indicating the direct, the, the particle, I mean, which one's the particle and which one's the antiparticle is first and foremost a weird question. All right, so, um, but this is like when we're labeling electrons versus anti-electrons, okay? So you should, this should be indicated by a line on the squiggle. 
So if I draw my blue on line going, and let me, let me ex exaggerate this. If I say my blue one's going down, damn it, then I know it's a red anti-blue. Okay? Hey, Alex? Yeah. So could you, for that second part, have it come out as like anti-blue and then have the glue on be like red and blue? Like, does that have to not be an anti-color or can the quark, like could it have come out as anti-blue instead of blue? Oh, oh, ah, uh, interesting. Very interesting. Can that happen and this be mediated by a red blue quark? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> it turns out, and we'll understand this in a few minutes, that the the quark or the gluons are always a combination of a color and an anti-color pair. Okay? Make sense? I mean, this, that, that is the restriction, and we'll understand in just a moment why. Okay? So, I, I just want you to notice, though, that this is an additional complication for doing Feynman diagrams for QCD interactions over and above what you encounter with QED, because for QCD, you have to be careful and pay attention to what color this is turning into and then label the glue on appropriately. And I want to bear in mind, like, it's not just labeling these with letters because letters don't do shit for you in a calculation. We're going to put numerical quantities associated with all these letters in a few minutes. Okay, so right now we're just kind of working at the, at the descriptory level and then we're going to go into the computational level in just a few minutes. But my point is, is that Color conservation is crucial. We can interpret gluons, sorry. We can interpret gluons as carrying a color and an anti-color simultaneously. And what makes QCD interactions interesting is that they're color converting, all right? Now, um, there's something interesting about this. It turns out that, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and cut to the chase on this, and this is something which we're going to partially derive next time. You can't see colored, or sorry, you can't see individual quarks. Individual quarks are, they, they don't exist. And we'll talk about why next time. But if you can't see individual quarks, what can you see? And it turns out that you can see colorless combination of quarks. Now, if you want to have a colorless combination of quarks, one guess might be if I have a quark, or if I have a, a, a sorry, it's not a quark that has no color, it's a pair of quarks that have no color. So, um, so we see quarks in hadronic states. So a hadron is just a collection of quarks such that the total color of that collection of quarks is zero. And this really just breaks down into two categories. First of all, there are mesons, okay, which are combinations of a quark and an anti-quark. They don't have to be the same quark. You can do an up and an anti-down, okay? And if you think about it naively, you could say, oh, well, if this had red and this had red, then that would have no color because the red and the anti-red would cancel each other, okay? And I'll fight about that in just a second, but that's a simple idea of thinking about how mesons are colorless and therefore why these pairs of quarks can exist in nature. And then the other combination is what we call baryons. And baryons are composed of either three quarks or three down quarks.
Because it turns out there's two ways to go colorless. Either you can do a color and an anti-color, or you can do all three colors. So if this is a red cork, a blue cork, and a green cork, then altogether that is colorless. And then, no, I don't expect you to use your intuition of colors and art and so forth on this. This is just the way that it works. Similarly, this, would be, this could be anti-red, anti-green, anti-blue, and that would be colorless. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about this next time. But what I just want to point out to you right now is because mesons are a class of quark systems that we often encounter, and gluons are combinations of two colors, one in a regular form and one in an antiform, then we might sort of catalog what combinations of colors are allowed. Because, you know, if you just think about it, um, you know, you, you have red, blue, and green, and then you have anti-red, anti-blue, and anti-green. And you can mix how much red there is, how much blue there is, and how much green there is. And so this is going to form a, a, a Hilbert space. And then we can ask, what are the eigenstates of that Hilbert space? So let me just write down the eigenstates of the two-color Hilbert space for you. So first of all, we have what's called the octet. And I'll just go ahead and ask, oh, Gabriel. Um, Gabriel, how many states do you expect in the octet? Uh, taking a wild guess, it's going to be eight. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Awesome. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so here, here's the set of octet states. And these are just color combinations. I'm not even going to tell you whether they're part of a gluon or part of quarks or whatever. These are just color combinations. I know. All right, I'm done. Avery, you get your ass back in the group. Okay. Now this is an octet set of states, and it turns out that there is also a singlet state. And the singlet state which we can call state nine, is special because of the following. Um, wait a minute. Okay, hold on. So a, a, a red, a blue, a green vector What, what do I use to rotate that? What, what do I use to transform that vector? Gabriel. Yeah, um, I have to actually go to my next class. Oh. Uh, oh. 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 
Well, you better tag yeah. somebody to answer all the questions. Oh, well, I will, hang on, let me, let me see who I need to tag in. Uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, Avery, do you feel like tagging in on this one? Yeah, I got it from here, Gabriel, thanks, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. All right, um, um Avery. And I'll, I'll dig your card out so I can show it every time. Um, tell me, what kind of matrix do we expect is actually going to act on this vector of RGB? Um, I have a feeling it's going to do, going to have to do something with the generators of that space. Uh, what is the space? Uh, color space. What is the set of symmetry transformations that act on color space? Uh, SU3. Yes, exactly. There's special unitary 3x3 three three matrices that we can use to rotate these into each other. That's if we have numbers here. And by the way, these can be complex numbers since SU3 can be a complex 3x3 three three matrix. Um, thank you, Avery. Anyway, okay. Um, all right. So um, now what I want you to realize is if I come in here and I do a transformation with some SU3 matrix, and you know, I don't, I don't know what the hell the SU3 matrices are. I don't have this memorized. But that can take these and it can interchange them. Maybe it does something like that. So the S, and I might have written that totally wrong. Shit, I wrote it right. I just did a random matrix and I actually got the result right. But anyway... Um, no, and this is a one. So anyway, but um, so the the act of the SC3 transformations is to take these components and reorder them. And so over here, what you would do is you would take, so what are we doing here? We're effectively taking R and B and, re and substituting it with B and R. So the R becomes B and the B becomes R. So for example, here, it takes this thing and makes it a, turns it into a B R bar and turns this into an R B bar and this is invariant, okay? However, this is not invariant, okay? Because it basically turns this term into this term but there's an overall minus sign. Ooh, uh, it makes this have an overall minus sign. Oh man, look at this. It turns the R into a B but leaves the G as a G. So generally, the SU3 transformations transform these octet basis states into one another. But that's what you kind of expect, right? If you're doing a rotation in space, rotations can take the basis and it can rotate the x into the y and the y into the z, or it can go into some linear combinations of those things, okay? So that's all these states are. It's a basis, or it's eight, it's an eight component set of basis states in color space, but there's one that is special, and this is the singlet. The singlet is exactly what you might guess. It's RR bar plus BB bar plus GG bar. How do you think this is transformed under an SU3 transformation? Avery. Exactly, it's invariant, okay? Thinking about space-like vectors, if we have x, y, and z, and I think about x squared plus y squared plus z squared, this is invariant under rotations. Of course, x, y minus z, x is not invariant. And x, y minus z, x is more like these things, okay? All right, um... So I just want to point out um, in, this, in this set of octet states, this guy right here, this particular one, number three, he might look colorless because it's red, red bar, blue, blue bar, but it can be impacted by SU3 transformation. So even though it doesn't have any color based on like I'm looking at red and anti-red and blue and anti-blue, what you really want to think about when you want to think about whether this is colorless or not is whether this transforms or doesn't transform under an SU3 transformation. And it clearly transforms under an SU3 transformation. 
And so too does this one, R R bar plus B B bar minus two G G bar. This transforms under SU3, most SU3 transformations as well, okay? But this guy is invariant under every single SU3 transformation that you could imagine throwing at him. Um, okay, are we ready? You ready? Avery. Avery? I'm ready. You ready? Okay, good. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to give you most of the Feynman rules for QCD, okay? And, um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to go with a comparison chart between the ABC theory, QED, and QCD so that you can kind of appreciate this ladder of escalating difficulty. But it will also let you see the elements of each um, formulation which are the same. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with external state labels. Then we'll do internal propagators. And then we'll do vertex factors. Now, when I write those words up there, they should somewhat mean something to you as a relevant part of the Feynman diagram story. But when I actually write up what they are, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's, yeah, that's cool. These are really the three essential ingredients that we build our M expressions out of. And then there's always the conserved momentum at a vertex and the integrate over the internal momentum. But that's kind of, that's kind of just fluffy bullshit. All right, so for the ABC theory, um, since the ABCs were scalar particles, there was no need to indicate the spin of the, or the orientation of the spin of the ingoing and outgoing particle because they didn't have any spin. So there was no label that we affixed to the incoming or outgoing ABC particles because they are spinless. You don't have to say anything about what direction their spin is pointing. If you encountered an internal ABC particle then, or a virtual particle, then you gave it a propagating factor of I over Q squared minus M squared C squared. And then the theory was based on this vertex which had to include one of each of the ABC field excitations, and then it corresponded to a simple minus I times G, where G is the coupling. This is what we would actually write in our element of M, along with these factors, and then nothing for the external states. Everybody remember this? Oh, thank you. oh, yeah, there we go. Thumbs up. Good, 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 good. Now let's go on to QED. Okay? For QED, it turned out that if we were dealing with matter coming in or out of the interaction, then we had to specify the uh, polarization of the spinner. You know, is it up or down? And um, so we had to tack on these labels, U, U bar, V, V bar. This is, of course, for incoming particles, outgoing particles, outgoing antiparticles, and incoming antiparticles, okay? And again, this is because in QED, it's a theory that's based on matter that's spinorial, okay, the fermions, and so we have to talk about the orientation of their spin as they come in or leave the interaction. And of course, if our, if our interaction has an external photon, then we also, and we really haven't done much with this, but we have to specify the orientation of the photon's polarization, okay? And of course, photons are vector particles, so their orientation is specified by this orientation vector. Now, um, if we have an internal matter line in the QED theory, then we 
know that we need to re, uh, write down a contribution of the following form. <coughs> Where remember Q slash is gamma mu P, gamma mu Q sub mu. Okay. And if we have an internal photon line, then we just write minus i eta mu nu over q squared. Okay? And then for the vertex, QED is built entirely out of a vertex of that form. And for each appearance of a vertex, we write that. Okay? So we've got our ABC story, very simple. Our QED story, which already gets uglier here, gets a little bit nasty there. Oh my God, that's a tensor. That's got a spin matrix. Ooh. What about QCD? Well, let's see. If we have incoming matter, outgoing matter, we have to label the spin of the matter because QCD is a theory of interacting quarks, and the quarks are spin a half particles, so we have to tack on a U, a U bar, a V, a V bar, but we also have to tell you what color configuration it carries, and so instead of just U, this will be UC, or U bar C dagger, or VC, or V bar C dagger, so this is what we have to put in for incoming or outgoing matter. And if we have incoming or outgoing gluons, then gluons are again represented by a vector. It's actually a one form, but we'll call it a vector. Um, but there's more than one gluon, right? I mean, we've got all these different, you know, bicolor pairs. So we have to specify that, and we'll specify that by an A alpha, and I'll talk more about what A alpha means in just a minute. And then, of course, we can have uh, the outgoing, and then that'll be A alpha star. Okay? So this is what we have to put for incoming and outgoing gluons. And then for the vertex factors, it turns out the vertex factors are not that much different. For an internal quark line in a diagram, our vertex factor looks exactly like it does in QED. Okay? However, if we have an internal gluon line, then we're still going to have minus i times a factor of the metric, and that's just handling the fact that the gluon has a directionality in space, which corresponds to a tensor. These are going to basically be affixed to each vertex that the gluon line is affixed to. But uh, we're also going to have to add in a delta alpha beta factor, and then q squared. Okay. And we'll talk more about that delta alpha beta factor in time. And then what about the vertices? Well, the vertices for QCD are relatively simple. We've got this vertex. And that vertex deserves a factor which is given by minus i g strong over 2 times lambda alpha times gamma mu. Okay. This is just remembering... The lambda alpha, well, I'll talk about what lambda alpha is in a minute, actually. But obviously, this is more complicated than the QED case, which is obviously more complicated than the ABC case, because we've got these structural things in there. This is just talking about the strength of it, and then these are kind of giving it some weird transformational properties. But remember, QCD has more interactions than just this. In fact, QCD has a three gluon vertex, and I'm not even gonna write down what you have to write down when you encounter a three gluon vertex because it's pretty nasty. 
And then it also has a four blue line vertex. Okay? So what's important is when you're considering a QCD process and you're trying to build the allowed diagrams, well, you can build your diagrams out of any of these, these, or these. And for each of these diagram, for each of these vertices as they appear in your, in your diagram, you put in the appropriate factor. And again, I'm not going to write down these two factors because they take a while to write down. Okay? So, um, now I, I just want to answer some questions and then we'll wrap it up for today. What are C, A alpha, and lambda alpha? So, um, the C's are the part of your um, wave function, if you will, which is describing your state in color space. Well, how many dimensions is color space? Avery? Three dimensions. It's three, exactly. So with C, we can literally take a basis like so. This is what I was saying earlier. We're going to have to not write down red, blue, and green because we can't do a damn calculation with that. Instead, we'll specify red as the 1, 0, 0 vector, blue is the 0, 1 vector, and green is the 0, 0, 1 vector. These we can put in and we can manipulate and multiply and add and all that shit, okay? Now, um, the arbitrary state of, a, of the color of a quark is a linear combination of these three. A quark doesn't have to be just red, just blue, or just green. It can be a vector pointing off at somewhere at an angle. Um, but these are complex. All right? So that means we need to have C dagger being CT transpose complex conjugate. And you'll notice there are these C daggers terms that appear here, okay? Now I'm just I'm just pointing out why it's daggered instead of just transposed because these vectors do, do not have to be real. They can be complex, and therefore, if you want to if you want to form the adjoint vector, then you have to transpose and complex conjugate it. Okay. Um, okay. So now I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to talk about. The A alphas. So first of all, there are eight gluons. And I can label this as A1 is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Yeah. Okay. A2, 0, 1, da, 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 da. So we can set up a basis in the eight dimensional Hilbert space, which that describes the gluons. And the gluons don't have to lie along one of these basis vectors. They can be a linear combination of these basis vectors. <coughs> All right. Now, um, I have a question for Avery. Avery, um, you know how we said earlier that gluons were a color and another anti-color. You remember that? How many colors are there? There are, there are three colors. How many anti-colors are there? Three. 
So if I took all possible combinations of a color and an anti-color, how many gluon states do you think I should have gotten? Nine? Yeah, so why are there only eight? Is it, does it have to do with the difference between uh, a normal orthogonal and special, oh wait, unitary and special unitary? Yes, it does. So remember, Pairing up two colors gives you nine bicolored states. So you might have thought that the group that you're working with is U3. However, I wrote down an octet of states and then I wrote down a singlet state. That singlet state is the one combination of color and anti-color, which is invariant under all SE3 transformations. So what you can imagine is that the U3 that you would naively expect, by the way, how many generators does U3 have? Avery? Is that to me again? Yeah. How many generators does U3 have? Nine, exactly. Nine, yeah. nine. This has nine generators, and that's kind of paired with what you expect if you're combining three colors and three anticolors in nine different ways. However, one way to write this is as an SU3 cross U1, where this SU3 acts non trivially on the eight octet vectors. And this U1 is governed by that singlet vector, which had no charge. It had no net color charge. It was invariant. Okay? Well, since QCD is based on this symmetry, not this symmetry, then we would expect there to be 9 minus 1, or 8 gluon states. And that was the octet that I gave you. Okay? So in terms of characterizing the gluons, we only describe gluons with the eight octet states. The gluons do not exist in that color singlet state. Okay? And we'll get an idea of why that's the case next time. All right? Okay. Um, so... Yeah, and then last but not least, and this is probably the headachiest one, but it'll get us there. Last but not least, there's lambda alpha. Now, um, where does lambda alpha appear? Lambda alpha appears... Oh, there it is. Okay. Now, um... Lambda alpha is a tricky little bastard because it shares some of the complicated things that we see in QED and other situations. So um, remember, in QED, um, and in this theory, because this is a theory with spinners, but in QED, we talked about the gamma matrices, and the gamma matrices always had a pair of suppressed indices, we might call it AB, because the gamma matrix is what kind of object in space-time, Avery? Can we use that one more time? The gamma matrices are what kind of objects in space-time? Um, uh, they are vectors. Yes! What kind of objects are they in spin-space? Yeah, so a gamma matrix is an object which connects space-time to spin space. But it doesn't do it as having a vector index in space-time and a vector index in spin space. No, it's a it's a it's a matrix in spin space and it's a vector in space-time. But it does connect space-time and spin space. The lambda alpha is a quantity in QCD which also carries two hidden subscripts, 
which I might call, um, I don't want to call them IJ, uh, let me see, we might call it AB, I don't know. Um, and here's the thing, this links the H, so I'll just write this down. So the AB, for which this is represented by a matrix, is a matrix in H3. That's the three-component Hilbert space, which is describing what feature of quantum chroma chromodynamics do you think, Avery? So H3 is a three-dimensional Hilbert space. Yeah. What part of QCD do you think that's describing? Oh, geez. Um, what are there three of? That's describing the, uh, the colors, the charge, right? The color space, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What is this H8 describing? What is the eight-dimensional Hilbert space describing? Yeah, exactly. Okay? So, in the same way that a gamma mu AB links up space-time where it's a vector to spin space where it's a matrix, the lambda alpha AB links up the space of gluons, which is eight-dimensional, to the space of color, where in, in where it's a matrix. Now these indices we're usually just going to leave off and we're just going to refer to the vector nature of this in, um, in the gluon space. Um, but that's it. Okay, I think I'm going to... Yeah, I think I'm going to... In today, I will, wait, I will say one more thing, which is that if I'm leaving off indices here, which these are color indices, that should tell you why I'm leaving them off of these as well. Because these are color states that are three component objects, and I'm either going to give them an index label or not, and it's just going to be notation-wise convenient to leave those off. So whenever you see a C, remember it's a three-component object, and remember there's a three-by-three three matrix nature to this, and you, you know, just have to kind of remember because we're ignoring the, um, we're ignoring the indices on these. And of course that means when we write down expressions, these and these have to be put in a sandwich, a color sandwich, in order to make a scalar, because here we've got a transpose of a color vector, We've got a matrix in color space, and then we've got a color vector, and the combination of those is going to give us an invariant in color space. All right? So that's very similar to what we did with spinners. It's just going to play out with colors. Okay? All right. Uh, I'm sorry for going over again, um, but let's call it quits. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. When we construct the sandwiches, when you say it's very similar to what we did with QED, yes. is that... Are they going to be next to identical? Well, no, you're going to have to do both in the QCD calculation because you've got spinners, right? You've got U's and U bars and V's and V bars, and you've got gamma matrices. So you're going to have to form a spinner sandwich in addition to a color sandwich. What's good, though, is that you can extract the color part from the spinner sandwich. When you write the terms down, you'll write them down, like write, you're gonna write down a UC, or actually you might write down a, a U bar C dagger, and then you might write down this, which is a matrix in, in color space, it's a matrix in spin space, and then you might finish by writing down this factor. 
And then what you can do is you can move the C and the C dagger and the lambda out of the spinner sandwich because they're, they're, they're trivial under spin uh, transformations. And so you can literally, literally write a color sandwich next to a spin sandwich and then you can use the tools we talked about to evaluate spin sandwiches and you can use other tools to evaluate the color sandwiches, which is what we're going to talk about next time, is evaluating color sandwiches. Okay, so yeah, there, it's going to be somewhat similar to what we did. Um, that's why we're being kind of the same with the notation, eliminating the indices, and just using the order that matters. But it's largely, I mean, it, it plays right off of what we did in QED with spinners. Okay, other questions? All right, hi-ho, uh, make sure you send your quizzes to Levi, and I will see you next Tuesday. Bye, guys.